If you were trapped with a bunch of gullible morons and forced to do the bidding of a faceless mechanical overlord hiding behind the television, what would you do? Nick's horrible family has made Christmas a living nightmare, and that's before their omniscient idiot box caged them up to play the world's worst game of Simon Says. Evidently, he wasn't the only one to come home for the holidays. Big Brother's in town too, which means everybody better fall in line lest they wind up in the hot seat getting pieces pulled off. Good thing they were barely clinging to sanity to begin with. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, try to make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the fake news in Await Further Instructions. What starts off as a joyous Christmas reunion of Merry Christmas. Uh, staff policy to put personal arrangements in writing about a month in advance. You're a clerk and your son's a deadbeat pansy. Yeah, never mind. This whole thing was a dumpster fire from the get-go. There's a reason Nick hadn't called home in over three years. His folks are completely unhinged. Better to just cut our losses and drown out the memory in a haze of peppermint schnapps and rum ham once we get home. All geared up for the great escape, lovebirds Nick and Angie make for the exit. But apparently, someone forgot to leave cookies for Santa. The whole house is cocooned in some kind of Kevlar cling wrap. Doors, windows, walls, everything but a paper-thin slot in the portion covering the front door. Looks like it's been fitted on purpose. Kids? Yes, I'm sure some of the neighbor kids managed to put down the rye pads long enough to completely envelop your parents' two-story home in corrugated sheet metal. TikTok's gone too far this time. For real though, nothing about this is okay. Not only could we be indefinitely detained as part of some over-the-top authoritarian lockdown measure, we might actually be forced to spend Christmas with these lunatics. This country used to be great till all them bongo bongos started coming in. That's not fair. How patronizing. Who do you think you are? Don't shout at my girlfriend. All right, that is enough. You'll apologize. We need to find a way out of here. Fortunately, the unflappable Nick has a plan. Yes, a tiny hand axe. Surely, whoever painstakingly encased our entire home in black licorice never could have anticipated we'd have one of these bad boys lying around. And it looks like it's super effective too. Perfect. How about instead of breaking every bone in your hand wailing away at solid steel, why not try wedging the blade of that axe in that slot and applying a little leverage? I mean, we won't exactly be able to climb out the opening, but at least we might be able to get a better view of our surroundings. Besides, if it turns out to be straight up World War Z out there, maybe we don't actually want to destroy the heavy metal shutter sealing off the entrance. Despite the prodigal son's best efforts, his repeated blows fail to leave so much as a scratch on the mysterious material. With brute force momentarily off the table, Nick and Angie both try shouting for help through the slot, but their attempts seemingly fall on deaf ears. That is, except for Daddy Dearest's. To do. I'm sure office manager Tony's totally got a lid on this situation. Like any good leader, father of the year naturally assumes everyone around him is just too stupid to understand what's really going on. However, upon trust but verifying his way through the house, he's left struck with the realization that they are, in fact, totally screwed. Alright, clearly this is some sort of serious emergency. Question is, what to do now? Should we start filling up the bathtubs with clean water and rationing up our available food? supplies? What about looking around for flashlights and extra batteries in case the power goes out? Nah, <laughs> what are you, some kind of prepper nerd? Let's just sit around casting wild speculations about the current situation. That'll get us out of here. Could it be a reality show? Some sort of awful game? It's too insane to be really real. A lawless logic. I'm sure Ashton Kutcher's hiding out nearby just dying to let you off the hook. Sadly, before anyone can toss alien abduction into the mix, Papa Bear drops the red pill we've all been waiting for. Only the government could manage something like that. Hear that, gang? It's just our tax dollars at work. Well, I for one feel so much better now knowing it was Big Daddy government that hemmed us up in this spam can and not school children or MTV. After all, when has that ever brought society to its knees? Nothing to do now but sit tight and wait for it all to blow over. Okay, fine. Let's assume Tony's right about this. Either we're being quarantined to prevent something in this house from getting out to the rest of the world, or the government somehow got its shit together long enough to bulletproof every last 
last house in the UK before Red Dawn clocks off. In both cases, the goal would be ensuring the survival of populations at large, meaning they probably couldn't care less if anyone in this one single family makes it to New Year's. One way or another, the fact is, we're on our own, so we need to take stock of our situation to try and find a way out, or at the very least, stay alive until somebody in a hat shows up with a can opener. The good news is the power's still on, and we've yet to be attacked by any kind of cybernetic spaghetti monster. Yeah, that's pretty much it for the good news. On the other side of the equation, it seems the Ruskies are jamming the cell towers, and there's no internet connection either, which means we can't even queue up any strategy videos based on our current situation. Oh, yeah, and we're also outnumbered 3 to 1 by a bunch of high-strung zealots ready to burn us alive at the stake for the slightest transgression. Not to mention good old Daddykins here is about 5 minutes away from Stalinism. Great. What else we got going on around here? Well, there's these pipes feeding into every single window in every single room in the entire house. Can't wait to see what those are all about. Well, they could be there to vent in clean oxygen, couldn't they? Sure, and they could also be there to fill the place full of pesticide if we refuse to pay our taxes. Seriously though, we could test out Tony's wishful thinking in about 10 seconds with nothing but a cigarette lighter. If that flame doesn't move, they aren't venting in jack, at least not yet. We could also try taping one of our cell phones to a broomstick or something and feeding it in with the camera rolling to try and get a peek at what's on the other side. Fortunately, they're all sitting outside the closable windows we still have full control over, so until we know exactly what they're meant to let in, we should just shut the windows and hope for the best. So for now on, we keep all the windows open, let the vents do their job. Okay, I guess we're just running with that completely unproven hypothesis. Perfect. While we're at it, let's go ahead and assume one of us has the key hidden behind an eyeball and just start going to town with an ice pick. Granddad, you're up first. Oh, and speaking of things that are outdated and useless, we haven't even checked in with the legacy media for our daily psyop. Better flip on the TV so we know whether to be angered or frightened by the current thing. You all better come see this. It has to be the emergency government broadcast. Yeah, I don't know what things are like over in Camelot, but here in the States, we test our emergency broadcast system frequently enough that your average Joe should be able to recognize it on the spot. You know, so we have time to be scared right before nuclear annihilation occurs. This looks like the title screen of some late 90s survival horror game. Then again, it is on every channel, and with any form of telecom being knocked out, it's really all we have to go off of. Besides, we already got the whole stay inside part nailed. Might as well keep it on to see what comes up while we work on an escape plan, just as long as we don't wildly overinterpret its instructions to the point that we're shooting up Drano. Nah, I'm sure there's nothing to worry about with this well-adjusted group of individuals. Ultimately, Tony takes this message from beyond as validation of the whole, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help, fantasy novel he's been working on. And since everything is clearly under control, he figures all that's left to do is an enjoy good old-fashioned Griswold family Christmas. I mean, they already have a crotchety old man that on everyone around him. All they need now is kitty cat barbecue and Randy Quaid drinking all the eggnog. However, before they can sit down to enjoy some semblance of a normal holiday, the fearless leader goes full sheepdog and tries rounding up some muscle in the form of Scott. We need to be shepherds, protect the herd, even from themselves. Get it? It's for their own good. That means we can do literally anything we want to them without any remorse or accountability. Someone get this man a uniform and a stick. With that out of the way, the gang gets to grubbing just in time for Granddad to start mouthing off at Angie's expense. Fortunately, Tony's able to reel things in before they get out of hand. And all it took was the passive threat of a butcher knife to the eye socket. Man, less than 24 hours in and we're already tearing each other apart. It's a good thing there's absolutely no end in sight. Now that that's settled, better carve up this beautiful bird before something else gets in the way. <laughs> I'm sure Beth did a great job. Oh, except what's that? Looks like the magic eight balls finally coughed up some advice. Look! Wow, perfect timing. What are the odds of that? Yeah, it's about this time you start to wonder if you're being watched. And then you remember the pint-sized predator drone you've been carrying around in your pocket for 15 years. All right, I get that coincidences are totally a thing that can happen, but either this message was broadcast to multiple homes as a general precaution, or it was sent specifically to us, which would mean they've been monitoring us since well before the walls went up. Either way, are we really supposed to believe literally all of our food is 
contaminated. As in, everything down to the vacuum sealed can of black olives that's been rolling around in the pantry for six months. If that's true, we must be more contaminant than creature by now. Whatever, at least if some of us decide to blow this off, it doesn't directly impact anyone else, right? I refuse to entertain your clever notions that could put this family's health at the risk. Really? You're not even going to consider the possibility that they got something wrong. Let's at least store the food in the refrigerator in case it changes its mind 30 minutes from now. Hey, what's Lumpty doing shoving us around like that? We're just talking. No need to go all Stasi on us. This is a bad sign. Tony's got a full-blown henchman to carry out his bidding now. It's only a matter of time before he starts rewriting the history books to say he invented golf. If I were Nick and Angie, I'd grab as much of the bottled water as they'll let us get away with and lock ourselves in the upstairs bathroom. Also, where's that hand axe? The last thing we need is for Muscle Brain and the God King to establish a monopoly on violence. Having eaten nothing, the family gathers in the living room to open presents, just in time for the latest drop from the almighty tube. Wait. Decontaminate yourselves, strip and scrub all flesh with household bleach. You're not actually gonna do that, are you? Not only is that gonna burn like a bastard, unless you get on all fours and scrub the entirety of the house beforehand, you're just gonna wind up recontaminating yourselves the second you're done. Get the cleaning products. Of course. Well, the good news is that unless Tony plans on personally overseeing each person's decontamination, we can just dab ourselves with a little bit of bleach water and pretend we... Oh, no, they're actually going through with it too. Yeah, I hope you don't have any open cuts or anything. With that little purification ritual out of the way, Nick and Angie come downstairs to apologize for behaving like totally rational human beings. But before the boots are sufficiently licked, jelly old Santa Claus drops one last present down the chimney. Apparently, he spent a little too much time over in Portland this year. Oh, and you know the man on the teleprompter's been dying to tap out this little gym. Okay. Yeah, no sh the atmosphere's polluted. What's that got to do with pumping ourselves full of garbage? But wait, there's more. According to Angie, i.e. the only one of us with any kind of medical training, it looks like these needles were scooped straight from the nearest McDonald's ball pit. I'm not loving it. You might be able to win me over on the whole no food thing, and maybe, just maybe, on the bleach bath. But this right here is where I get off. Go ahead, let young Scott Ward work me over with the basiling planisher. You can kill me and give my corpse to the poke if it's that important to you. Okay, they're sterilized. Mmm, hepatitis stew, just like mom used to make. Yeah, that doesn't change a thing, but don't bother telling these idiots that. Nah, a little splash of warm water is all they need to actually go through with this. Even Kate, with one in the chamber, only needs about 30 seconds of convincing to roll the dice on her unborn child's life. Look, there's two left. I wonder who the holdouts are. Doesn't anyone find it the least bit suspicious that they knew exactly how many hypos to slip under the tree? You know, given only Tony, Beth, and Gramps actually live here, and Nick and Angie only dropped in by surprise at the last minute. Seems like they might be watching us. I'm all for a little purposeful compliance, but this seems a little bit like the Russian roulette scene from Deer Hunter. Now's when you squirt the mystery solution into the fireplace and tell Tony where to shove it. I'd rather take my chances with his response than whatever our reaction to the mystery shot might be. I mean, you could try to weasel out of it by pulling the whole wooden sword through the armpit routine, but given all eyes are on us right now, I don't think that's gonna slip past them. Or you could just do it and potentially sign yourself up for a lifetime of misery. That works too. Now we're safe. <laughs> What's that? I couldn't hear you over the sound of the karma of Granddad horking up his insides. Oh, but just wait until you hear how Boss Man rides the mental pommel horse on this one. You see, according to Dr. Tony, the fact that only Pappy took the hardwood temperature challenge means the medicine totally worked, just not on him. Turns out, had we not jabbed ourselves at the exact moment we did, we would have been hacking up the asphalt right alongside him. Let that sink in for a moment there, Angie. Oh, and wouldn't you know it, the TV somehow knows the exact moment we all injected. Nothing to read into there. I'm sure they just estimated the amount of time it would take us to mull it over and watch our not-so-loved one puke himself to death. Those algorithms, getting pretty good, right? There really are some ingenious and sensible people working in government these days. So. I'll say, such a genius, cost-cutting measure reusing needles like that. Surely, only a high-powered bureaucrat mind could come up with such an idea. Speaking of which, the TV wants its junk back. Apparently, there's plenty more families out there in need of their cootie shots. Better have Scott round up the fun sticks and send them out the front door. I'm sure there's no way a knuckle dragger like him could ham that up, right? <laughs> <laughs> ah! 
E of little faith. It's because you didn't believe enough, Scott. Hopefully that'll teach you for not blindly trusting the government's plan for your well-being. That's a red flag if I've ever seen one. It's not like he was gonna crawl out of there. This was clearly a disciplinary strike. Gotta make sure the subjects know not to push the boundaries. Whatever. Better heat up the skillet before simple Jack passes out from blood loss. The good news is Tony's right-hand man is now pretty much nothing but a right-hand man. Should make it a lot easier to roll out the guillotine with him partially incapacitated like this. By the way, you might want to consider going that route sooner rather than later. King Tony's getting crazier by the minute. You called me Squelcher. Why? Because you wet the bed. Of course. More daddy issues. What a surprise. Why break the cycle of abuse when you could just pass it on to the people that depend on you? After all, you turned out just fine. I really hate to say it, Nick, but you're probably gonna have to pull an Oedipus on this one. Well, the first half anyway. I mean, unless you can find a way out that doesn't involve more dismemberment, and it's not looking good. For Christ's sake, they even managed to weave that metal crap under the tar paper in the attic. I guess you could try chipping away at the chimney shaft with a hand axe, although since that's where the needles came from, I'd say they probably have that avenue covered. Plus, I don't see that happening without getting Tony's attention, and he probably won't take too kindly to an impromptu remodeling without his permission. About the only other option would be tunneling out underground, but given the rate at which these instructions are escalating, the others will probably wind up cutting our hearts out on an altar before we ever make it out through the foundation. Better start preparing for when things finally come to a head. I'd start surreptitiously squirting whirling away all the sharp objects I could find, if only to keep them away from Scott and Tony once the shit really hits the fan. Although, I'm sure it can all wait until morning. Come downstairs. There's something we need to discuss. Ah, fond memories of when my parents used to say that. What's the magic conch want this time? Bloodletting? Nah. It just wants us to isolate one of our own for being infected. Good thing it doesn't provide a single bit of guidance for who that might be, or what they might be infected with. Oh, but don't let that stop Kate from hurling accusations at Angie for having the sniffles. Who ever heard of someone getting sick over the holidays? Hey, what about Scott? I mean, he literally just lost three fingers checking the oil on the containment shield. Besides, if it really is Angie's head cold, you'd all be infected by now too. Hey, I know, let's put it to a vote. Everyone who says we should imprison the only person with medical experience during a crisis of indeterminate magnitude, raise your hand. And mom abstains. Well, looks like that settles it then. Angie, your group mates have voted to lock you up for no good reason. Democracy. Oh, hold up. Looks like Nick wants a recount, and he's got a lamp cord? Jesus, dude, I think you might want to use the other side. Yeah, like that. Naturally, this bright idea falls to shit almost immediately, but before Tony and Scott can dish out the punitive beatdown, Beth comes in clutch with a little tactical insanity and stops everyone dead in their tracks. Uh Is written with angels singing? R.I.P. headphones. Who knew we had a human L rat in the house? Probably could have come in handy during the floor vote 30 seconds ago. Just saying. Unfortunately, the spontaneous Christmas caroling doesn't warm anyone's heart enough to get Angie off the hook. So, it's off to the gulag for her, alone, away from the lunatics. Wait a second, can we come too? It's gotta be better than hanging around with these nutjobs, especially with what's right around the corner. Besides, with the fear of infection keeping them at bay, we'd be free to search for a way out. Or, at the very least, spend our last few remaining hours enjoying each other's company. With the only other sane person locked up in the guest room, Nick decides that now is probably a good time to start shaking things up. His first order of business, turn off the television. Yeah, probably should have thought of that before your entire family started hanging off its every word. Who knows what they're liable to do just seeing you standing next to it, much less screwing around with it. Dad! Nick broke the telly! Gee, thanks, sis. See if I watch your brat now. Predictably, Tony reacts to the news like someone just shot his mother, and the red text of doom that appears on screen doesn't lighten the mood one bit. Might not have been such a great idea to stick around the holy appliance long enough for the rest of the congregation to catch on to your heresy. A better approach might have been shutting it off at the breaker box, provided it's accessible. Otherwise, just yank the cord and split before anyone notices. Not that they wouldn't immediately accuse the ill Illuminati the second they found it, of course. Despite his best efforts to play it off as a simple science project, Nick's failed speech check forces him into a self-defense situation against a hail of angry girl slaps, which Scott takes as an opportunity to further flex his misguided machismo. The ensuing brawl drags on upstairs, with Kate running right up on their heels for moral support. You know, cause every cage match needs an extremely pregnant woman backseat boxing directly over your shoulder. How could that end poorly? <laughs> 
I'll give that dive a three, but only because she just broke the one leg. All right, fun's over. Time to let Angie out of her cage before Kate bleeds out under the mistletoe. Oh wait, that's right. She has to stay under lock and key over her barely perceptible illness. Besides, it's just a compound fractured femur. Not like there's any major arteries around there. I'm sure we can easily DIY this without any prior medical training whatsoever. Fear not, family. Turns out Scott here happens to work in a hospital. I guess they must need someone to lug all the bodies around. Well, don't just stand there. Fix your wife. What could possibly be so important on the TV right now? That's reassuring. Unfortunately, this little fiasco proves to be more than Dr. House can handle, prompting Nick to assume control over his sister's care. As for Admiral General Tony, all this racket's really done his head in, so he decides to retire up to his study and spend the rest of his night pondering life's great mysteries. Honestly, it's still probably the best decision he's made all night. Seriously though, Kate's a goner unless we can get her to a hospital. I mean, we could try scrounging up some antibiotics to try and stave off sepsis for a little while, but there's pretty much nothing we can do for her here short of a mercy killing. As for the bun in her oven, it's 50-50 whether kiddo's still kicking. And even then, they probably won't be playing for Liverpool when they grow up. Of course, if mom checks out, we'll have to perform an emergency cesarean to have any hope of getting them out alive. Hear that, Scott? Might want to dig up that turkey for a practice run. We're gonna need you on deck here in just a few. With her daughter comfortably screaming herself to death on the couch, Beth tries asking nicely for the TV to drop a couple stem packs down the chimney. Yeah, let's see how that works out for you. Meanwhile, Nick consults Angie through the door, only to learn that Kate's pretty much beyond boned if they don't find a way out fast. He relays this little pep talk to Scott in hopes of winning him over, but the mouth breather is still dead set on playing follow the leader, cause that's been working great so far. Okay, Nick, time for a show of strength to win the hearts and minds of those around you, with Tony sequestered off in his playroom studying siege tactics or whatever. Now's our chance to shut the TV down permanently before it starts playing salad fingers. I'd say just snip the cord and be done with it, but they probably would just try splicing it back together. Better to just find something heavy and avoid the shit out of the warranty before anyone can stop you. Of course, Dad's gonna hit the ceiling the second he hears the glass break, but even a desk jockey drone like him should realize killing us won't bring it back. Besides, any second now, it could tell him to scoop her eyes out with a melon baller. At least with it gone, he won't be getting any more coaching. Having failed to enlist the help of his brother-in-law, Nick starts searching for a way out but there doesn't seem to be any way around the ubiquitous barrier. Yeah, just go right back to beating on the front door. You were so close last time. Eventually, Harry Houdini runs out of steam and heads upstairs to answer nature's call. Fortunately, once again, the bathroom proves itself a source of all great ideas. Mid-flush, it dawns on him that the sewer pipes must be unobstructed for the plumbing to still be working. Perfect. Now we just have to hack ourselves to pieces and take turns flushing each other down the toilet. Any volunteers? The realization leads him to believe that the area around the pipes must also be free from containment, because that's how plumbing works, apparently. Oh, well, it's worth a try. Just be ready to face the consequences if someone catches you with your pants down. After chipping away at the wall around the pipe, Nick fastens his phone to a broom handle and sends it through to record what's on the other side. Yup, that's what happens when you don't pay the cable bill. Anyway, apparently this little peep show is too hot for TV, prompting the sensors to sound the alarm and pull Papa Bear out of his cave. Despite the fact that he totally vanished into thin air at the first sign of trouble, somehow Tony still commands enough loyalty to drag Scott out on the warpath. And the two head straight to the upstairs bathroom, ready to shoot first and ask questions never. Hey, Nick, you hear that god-awful screeching coming from downstairs? Something tells me it might be related to your little fishing expedition. Might want to get on your feet and lock the door before the goon squad barges in and hauls you off for a questioning. I thought you could see this. Stay calm. <laughs> Bro, did you not see this guy willingly stick himself with a dirty syringe without hesitation? There's literally nothing on that phone you could have shown him that was gonna wake him up. Better to just keep it hidden away in case you get some more alone time with one of your slightly less brainwashed family members. That is, of course, provided you make it out of this room with your tongue still intact. With the bad seed secured, Tony sends Scott downstairs for more advice from their TV guide. But I think we all know where this is headed. Well, all of us except Nick here. Apparently, he thinks some 
some fragment of a human being is still rattling around inside his father's head. Unfortunately for young Plato, Captain Caveman is entirely post-truth up in here, and his last-ditch effort to pull the wool back only gets him a sock in his mouth. All right, Scotty, tell him what he's won. Oh, it's a brand new tool set straight to the face. Gotta give it up for Tony for doing the dirty work himself instead of pawning it off on the handyman. Except, he forgot the whole speech about this hurting him a lot more than us. Somehow, working him over with a box cutter fails to produce anything of value. Gee, it's almost like he doesn't know anything. Huh, or maybe it's just because you suck at torturing. Seriously, dude, there's more blood on you than him right now. How does that even work? Unfortunately for Nick, the Inquisition is just getting warmed up. Tony figures he'll be a lot more cooperative with one less eye. But before he can get the point across, Beth cries out from downstairs to report that Kate has finally given up the ghost. Darn, if only the two most important men in her life bothered to make her survival their personal responsibility, then maybe she might have lived long enough to die horribly in the final confrontation with the hidden puppet master. Oh well, if there's one thing Tony's illustrious career as an office manager has taught him, it's that sometimes people die. And you just have to say, screw it, and get back to gouging your son's eyes out. Mm. In war, there are always casualties. Well, it's about goddamn time someone did that. Apparently, Caligula was only one slop away from a nervous breakdown. It's a good thing we figured that out now that two of us are dead and there's an innocent child suffocating to death inside its dead mother. Not to mention the fact that the only person that could actually do anything about it got locked up to placate the whims of an ancient television set. This is all going so swimmingly. Speaking of Angie, she's finally capitalized on her many hours of isolation to try and find a way out of this dump. Using a wire hanger, she manages to weave a hook through the wall material and pluck loose an individual strand. Wow, looks like some kind of camera. You just found the one weak spot in the impenetrable husk trapping us inside. Forget the camera, grab every last hanger in that place and tear the rest of them out. Even if you can't clear enough space to climb out, you might be able to get a glimpse of what life is like on the other side. I mean, for all we know, the police have been trying to saw their way inside since dinner. <laughs> nah. In all likelihood, the rest of the world is just as screwed as we are. I mean, come on, do you think some kind of all-seeing cable monster would randomly manifest itself just to torment this jolly bunch of Whatever. I guess we'll never know, because instead of investing all her energy on the single most important discovery they've made so far, Angie breaks away from the window to go snooping around the cabinets. Hey, look, another even older television set. Not wanting to miss out on the annual Christmas story marathon, Angie fires it up to find a cryptic countdown with only 23 minutes remaining, followed by the same I see you message Scott saw earlier. I'm gonna take a wild guess and say whatever happens at the end of that countdown we're probably not gonna like. Might want to set your phone timer to match that one on the screen so we know when to duck and cover. Wait, why are you taking off the back panel? I mean, the words don't actually come from inside the TV, do they? Do they? And it's alive. Great. Well, hopefully that means we can make it unalive. I'm no electrician, but I'd say a good place to start would be by ripping out its still beating heart and holding it up to the cameras. Meanwhile, back downstairs, it seems the main monitor isn't too keen on Angie messing around with Junior. It flashes a message across the screen stating a quarantine is being activated in the bedrooms one and two, which apparently involves filling them up with some kind of thick black smoke. Yeah, I know I haven't exactly been taking this thing at its word so far, but I got a feeling those skulls and crossbones are legit. Lucky for Angie, Beth and Scott freed Nick in time for him to struggle helplessly against the locked door. Jesus, of all your dad's failures, chief among them has to be raising a son that can't kick an interior door. Put your ankles in it, dude. Your girlfriend's life depends on it. Of course, it probably couldn't hurt for her to actually try and do something to save her own life, like stopping up that pipe with her jacket or shutting the window. Nah, better just stand there and wait for someone else to solve all your problems. I mean, it worked in Jurassic World Dominion. Oh, and sure enough, enough, Scott manages to chase down the keys before it's too late. Although it probably would have been faster if he just shoved Nick out of the way and put it in himself. After all, he's got a personal stake in her survival as well. Party's not over yet though, as Beth went and locked herself inside the bathroom somehow. I don't get it either. Anyway, the guy who couldn't break through the fiber board with all his strength decides he's gonna Superman punch his way through laminated glass instead of finding literally anything he could use to augment his striking power. It goes about how you'd expect. <laughs> Damn. 
damn. Okay, maybe not exactly how you'd expect. With the super smoke hot on the trail, Nick and Angie regroup with the others down in the living room, just in time for the terrible telly to bust out its finishing move. In a desperate bid to win back their devotion, the TV sheds all pretenses of human authority and just flat out heralds itself as the second coming of Christ, even flashing the potential baby names of Scott's as yet undelivered child as proof of its omnipotence. Never mind a cesarean. According to the 700 Club, the only way to save the unborn child is by conducting a human sacrifice, which these two guys gobble up without a second thought. Might want to check Revelations again there, Tony. I don't recall it mentioning anything about a sentient home electronics, which can create smoke that makes you explode. Naturally, Nick and Angie see the writing on the wall and arm up for what will almost certainly boil over into a brutal life and death showdown between father and son. Nah, they actually just lay down and go to sleep. You know, because nothing about this latest development screams ritual homicide. Bro, your dad just tried to poke your eye out with a screwdriver like five minutes ago. How the hell are you not hovering over him with a hand axe right now? Oh well, should have thought of that before the crusades clocked off. Things aren't looking great for the unbelievers right now, but before Tony can wrench his knife and open up a can of Campbell's tomato, Angie swears on her life that she can save Scott's baby, which is apparently all he needed to hear to let Nick out of the bear hug. <laughs> Wow, I bet that felt great. What, with your trickle-down daddy issues and all? Hey, you know what would feel even better? Picking up the kitchen knife and planting in his ribs before he gets back up and totally f***s your day up. Oh, and Scott, you might want to get in there too so Dr. Quinn over here can focus on holding up her end of the bargain. It's going to be pretty difficult for her to perform surgery with Empire Strikes Back playing out all around her. Eventually, the expectant father enters the fray, only to immediately catch an axe to the chest. Ouch. Well, at least we don't have to worry about the baby anymore. Now Angie's free to lend a helping hand. Sure wish he'd have done that sooner rather than later here, cause little Nicky's in way over his head. Ah! That was useful. Maybe next time, don't start screaming triumphantly until you're holding his severed head. We're just lucky the sight of his beloved catching an axe head was enough for Nick to tap into his hidden nerd rage. Too bad he wasn't smart enough to stomp Tony's lights out the second he hit the ground instead of going for the strangle. The resulting struggle ends with Nick on the losing end of a Homer Simpson, but before Tony can put a bow on this eulatide massacre, Angie hits the self-revive in time to clutch it with a champagne bottle. Of course, like any good middle manager, Tony doesn't know when to quit. Good thing the TV's right by his head. Looks like he should have sprung for the flat screen. With the battle finally over, Nick and Angie are finally free to enjoy the holiday season in peace. Oh, except not really, because they still haven't found a way out of this hellhole. Plus, there's still one last control freak left to put down. What, you didn't think it was over, did you? Now nah, we're stacking boss fights, Elden Ring style. And it doesn't look like this next one's going down so easy. Might want to splash some water on that thing before it strings you up like a meat puppet a la Tony. Then again, it's not even plugged in right now, so I'm guessing it plays less by electric rules and more by the Necronomicon. Knowing when they're beat, Nick and Angie retreat to the next room over and barricade themselves inside with a single bookcase before calling it good the second the ground stops shaking. After all, I'm sure it's probably not upset about us smashing its screen or anything. <laughs> Look who's back for round two. Worship me now or face your extinction. Boy, if Tony were still alive, I bet he'd really be enjoying this right now. For real though, we might want to ask what all this worshipping entails because right now we're pretty much out of options. I mean, if all we have to do is sit back and watch Looney Tunes forever, count me in. On the other hand, if it involves any more used medical equipment, that's going to be a hard pass. Ultimately, it doesn't matter because Nick over here seems to think that it can't actually kill us on its own. I'm not sure what about this current situation is giving him that idea, but he's willing to go so far as to tear down the barrier and square up on this thing like it just knocked over his beard. As the ghost in the machine makes one final attempt to bring them into the fold, Nick closes in to find the bottle of champagne still ready to pop off. With one last look into the twisted black heart of the mass media, he throws the bottle into the receiver and dives for cover. <laughs> Cool light show. Too bad it didn't work. That's right, after a brief reboot, the monster monitor ropes up Nick and Angie for one final snuggle session before sending its toy soldier in to smash their brains out with a hand axe. I guess that's what you get for putting all your eggs in the whole it needs us to kill us basket, huh? With all our heroes gone for good, the TV uses its tendrils to piranha the flesh away from Kate's body until only her baby remains. Somehow, it's still alive and without sufficient motor function to crawl away. It looks like young Ruby is 
is the perfect candidate to worship the flickering god for the rest of eternity. In the end, everyone wound up dead. Well, except for the baby. Although a lifetime of TV parenting doesn't really sound like living to me. While Angie might have been able to break a small hole in the bedroom window using the hanger, I'm not sure she could have made it out of there without getting smoked into oblivion. And since we never found a way to defeat the TV, I'd say await further instructions remains unbeaten. Moral of the story, smash your television and watch YouTube instead. Gamer Subs Nerds, the third of the four secret waifu shakers is out now, and that's not the only thing that's out. It's an interesting shirt design for sure. Lots of ventilation for hot summer days. Pick one up to support the channel and your gaming performance. Use my code UNBEATEN to get 10% off anything else.